from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome. I'm Thea Austin, the Public Events Coordinator for the American Folklife Center, and on behalf of the entire staff, I want to welcome you to our 2016 Homegrown Concert Series. In this, the 40th year, of, 40th anniversary year of the creation of the center, and today we're featuring the legendary Ingramettes. The Homegrown Series is designed to feature the very best of traditional music, dance, and narrative arts. To do this, the Folklife Center works with many talented and dedicated folk arts coordinators from across the country and across the world. They help us select exciting and performers from the most important and representative traditions within their communities and bring them to Washington, D.C. Today's concert is brought to you in partnership with the Virginia Folklife Program at the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities and with the Kennedy Center's Millennium Stage. You can catch these wonderful performers a second time tonight, if you like, um, from 6 to 7 p.m. at the Kennedy Center. Our performance today will be webcast, so this is a good time to turn off your cell phones, or you will become a permanent part of this concert and the Folklife Center's collections. Um, when the webcast is up online, it will stay up in perpetuity, and people all over the world will be able to watch the wonderful concert you're going to see today. Virginia State folklorist John Lohman recommended the legendary Ingramettes to us for this series. For more than five decades, the Ingramettes have been bringing their music and ministry to congregations in the Tidewater and the Piedmont. Their commanding spirit-filled performances demonstrate the extraordinary depth of talent in American gospel music. The group is one of Virginia's premier gospel ensembles. Born in, on July 4, 1930, on Mulholland's plantation in Coffee County, Georgia. Founder Maggie Ingram worked in the cotton and tobacco fields with her parents. She began playing the piano and singing at an early age and developed a great love for the church and the ministry of the gospel. She formed Sister Maggie Ingram and the Ingramettes, a singing group that became sought after for appearances throughout Florida. In 1961, Maggie moved her family to Richmond where she worked in the home of Oliver W. Hill, the prominent civil rights attorney who represented the Virginia plaintiffs in the landmark Brown v. Board of Education case. The family joined Love's Temple Church of God in Christ and began singing around the city. With her children, Maggie also began a prison ministry partnering with Mount Gilead Baptist Church in the 1970s to institute programs like Family Day in Virginia prison camps. The Ingramettes are gospel icons in Richmond and rece have received numerous awards, including the prestigious Virginia Heritage Award in 2009. Maggie was awarded a doctorate of music from Virginia Triumphant College and Seminary in 2011. And though Maggie has now passed, the Ingramettes carry on her work. Please welcome the legendary Ingramettes. o'clock this morning yes. to get ready to drive in from Richmond, Virginia. And just took in all the sights on the way in, the wonderful traffic that you guys have to navigate through every day. It's just been a wonderful day. It's a joy for us to be here. And um, uh, somebody said, Ingramettes. Well, yeah, that's because we're Maggie Ingram's kids and grandkids. And, and, and when in, we don't say in-laws, we got in-loves up here. And so this has just been a wonderful experience for us. And we hope that something that we say today, ministry has spanned now. 
I've been here now uh, six decades singing with this ministry. And God has just blessed us and been so good to us. So we hope that you enjoy it today. Now I tell you what, we, we like to hear a little noise out there when we sing. All right? All right, so we're just gonna we're gonna do what what it is we do, and we hope that you're going to enjoy yourselves. This is uh, this traditional homegrown music festival. I, when when Thea called, I said, now, "Thea, have you ever heard us sing?" Cause we make a lot of noise, and I know we come into the Library of Congress, but I, I don't I don't know about you, but. Dear, near and dear to my mom's heart when she was teaching us as little ones how to sing. Some of the first things we did were hymns. And so we'd like to take a minute and just open this morning with a, a little, little hymn, arrangement of a hymn that my mom told us. I serve a risen Savior
I want to, for those of you who never seen us before, I want to talk to you about the matriarch of this group that the Lord called home. My mom on last year, June 23rd, 2015, I stood there by her bedside holding her hand as the Lord called her home. And as I sat there with her, just millions and millions and millions of things just going through my mind, I, I thought most of all about our childhood. And I thought about the song that, that she taught us when I, when I was a teenager and, and, and it took me a lot of years to understand what she meant when she told me this. I remember as a little child, we lived in Miami, Florida, in a little section of town called Coconut Grove. That's not too far from Liberty City. And if you know where Liberty City is, that's where the old Orange Bowl Stadium was. My dad used to cut the grass over there with a push more. My mom worked as a maid. She cleaned people's houses for a living because there were five of us, three little boys and two little girls. And she was determined that even though she had been pulled out of school that while she was in the third grade to work in the fields with her mom and dad because they were sharecroppers on Mulholland's plantation. She was determined that we would, would get an education, so she sent us to school every day. Now, it had some challenges because we were one of those families. You hear a lot of people say, well, we was poor, but we didn't know it. We was poor, and we knew we was. Lord, help me, Jesus. And we was poor, and we knew we, we, knew we was poor because she had three boys all school age, but was only able to afford two pair of pants from the Goodwill store. And so one day, two of my brothers would, would wear the pants and go to school, and the other brother would stay at home. And then they would come back home and share with him what they had learned in school that day. And, and the next day, he would get to go, and one of the other ones would get to go, and one of the ones who had went the day before would stay at home. And it went that way until she was able to afford another 75 cents pair of pants over at the Goodwill store. And so it was, I remember that one morning I got ready to go to school. I was in the third grade. We all went to George Washington Carver Elementary School. I don't think there's a black community that don't have a George Washington Carver. I know everybody got a Martin Luther King school now, but... Back in the day, it was George Washington Carver Elementary School. I'm 64 years old, and I still remember being in the third grade, and Teresa McCray was my third grade teacher. Miss McCray, I don't know if you'll ever get to see this. I don't know if you're living or dead, but I want you to know that something very special happened to me that day. My mommy gave me a note to take to school. I thought it was a little strange that, that mama would give me a note to take to school because most of the time you get a note from the teacher to bring back home with you. She said, now when you get to school, you give this to your teacher and don't you lose it. And so I did. I skipped on into the classroom and I gave Miss McCray the little note and she took it and she read it. She didn't say anything then, but she said, listen, when at the end of the school day, now you come back to my desk, after all the children have gone, I want you to come back to my desk. And I'm gonna give you something to take home to your mom. And I don't want you to lose that, I want you to take it straight home. So at the end of the day, I came up from my desk after all the children had left, and she gave me a cigar box. Now that's in the days before we had a Walmart that sells pencil cases and all that. Some of y'all are old enough to remember everything we had went in a cigar box. I don't know where we found so many cigar boxes. Now that I'm grown, I'm trying to figure out. But everything, we had pencils, ink, pen, whatever, crayons, everything went in a cigar box. 
she gave me a cigar box that had a piece of tape on it. And she said, now don't you dawdle, you go straight home and I want you to give this to your mother. And so I did. I, I went on home. I said, mommy, Miss McCray gave me something to give you. And mommy went to the kitchen and sat down to the table. She opened the box and I noticed that she started counting coins and there were some dollar bills in the box. And she told my three brothers, she said, now y'all watch your two little sisters. I'm going to go to the store and, and get something so you all can have some dinner and, and I can pack you a lunch tomorrow. And so when mommy left, I went over to the kitchen table and I read the note. It was a note from my mommy to my teacher saying, listen, I don't have any food in the house and I don't have any money and if you could, could you ask some of the other teachers to put something in the, in, in the box and send it home with my daughter so I, can, so I can buy a little food and pack them a lunch on tomorrow. And when I read the note, I got real embarrassed. And I didn't want to go back to school at all the next day because I felt like everybody would be looking at me. And so mommy came back home with the groceries and she, she packed the lunches and, and put a little apple in there and, 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 and gave us each a little nickel to, to buy our milk. And, and I stood by the door not wanting to go to school the next day. She said, I want you to take this note back to your teacher. I opened the note, got halfway to school, and it was just a thank you to tell her thank you for being so kind and for helping and so when I, I got home that afternoon, I said, Mommy, I read the note. And I said, how was your day? I, uh, I had a bad day that day because I was ashamed and I was embarrassed that we had had to ask somebody for help. And that's when my mama helped me to understand. It took me a long time to realize what she was trying to say to me it is that what you have is more important than what you don't have. I want you to go back to school, hold your head up high, because what you have, you've got a blessing from God, and what you have on the inside of you, it's more important than what you don't have. And here is why, for all the young people in this audience today, you're never going to be judged on what you don't do with what you don't have. But you will always be judged on what you do with what you do have. you have is more important than what you don't have. And so 1969 rolls around and I graduated from high school. I graduated in a borrowed cap and gown because mommy didn't have money to buy the cap and gown. I was a member of the National Honor Society and one of the guidance counselors borrowed the little blue stole that you wear, the little special stole that you wear when you're a member of the Honor Society because we didn't have the $5 to buy one. But what I had on the inside was more important than what I didn't have. And so I want to thank Miss Nina Simone for writing this song because it helped me to understand what mama had tried to tell me all those years. Here's the words of the song.
his name. Bless his holy name. Bless his holy name. Bless his holy name. Well, y'all ready to keep on working? Yes, sir. Y'all ready to work a little bit? Come on.
we're getting ready to go, but before we go, I wanna, I wanna share one more song with you. Oh, bless his name. Oh, hallelujah. I remember when we moved to Richmond, Virginia from Miami, Florida. It was 1961, and in 1961, there was no Interstate 95 that connected Miami, Florida with Richmond, Virginia. And so, in a time of terrible trouble, my mom found herself being a single parent, packed her five little children, in a 1956 green and white Chevy Bel Air and got on Route 301. They call that the truck route for those of you who are used to driving the interstate. And you got to understand that the truck route runs right through all the little towns in, in Georgia and in South Carolina and in North Carolina. And so it was as my mama made a perilous journey with five little children and just herself. We, we drove through many, through many cities in Georgia and in South Carolina and, and we saw the signs that said whites only. I remember my mom left in the middle of the night on the 23rd and by the next day she was so tired she had to pull over and rest. And the only service station in sight was one that had the sign posted, no colors allowed. She pulled in the service station anyway. And when the owner came out, he said, girl, can't you read? I said, mommy, we're not supposed to be here. She said, please, sir, it's just me and my little children. We're not going to get out of the car, but we're on our way to Richmond, and I'm, I'm just so tired. I need a little rest. We're not going to bother anything if you just let me sit in the parking lot of your service station and get a little rest. Well, I want you to know God touched the service station owner's heart, and he let mommy park in the station. And she and us, we... We all leaned over and tried to get a little rest. Well, we noticed one thing he did. He, he went back in the service station. He got his shotgun and a chair and he sat right outside the service station where we were and he laid his rifle across his lap. And, and every time the, the state trooper or the sheriff would come by and, and they would say, everything all right? He would wave them on. He said, no, everything's all right here. I told them they could get a little rest. I'm just, I'm just sitting out here to, to watch over them while they sleep. So it was before day that, that next morning we were awakened by a tap on the window. My mama rolled down the window. She said, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to stay so long. And as she got ready to, to crank the car, he said, just a minute, ma'am. I want you to get on out and go in the restroom there, wash your face and take the children with you. You all going on in and, and get yourself washed up. And, and, and while you do that, I got, some, I got some little nabs and sodas in my service station here. I'm going to pack y'all something to eat before you go. And so we went into the, the whites only service station and, and we washed up and mommy brought us out. We got into the car and, and he gave her the bag with with the little crackers and little nabs and sodas in there. He looked at it, he said, ma'am, do you have enough gas to get where you're going? She said, well, I, I, I need to get some, but I, I, I can go to a, a color. So he said, no, you pull right over there to my pump. She said, I got to be real careful with my money because I don't have a lot of money. And, and gas in 1961 was, was real expensive. Gas was 17 cents a gallon. And so he filled up the gas tank. We had a little prayer with him and, and we struck out on our way to Richmond, Virginia. 
when we got to Richmond, it was Christmas Eve night, and the little house that they had prepared for us to go in, it, it had a big old pot belly stove in the middle of the living room. There were some holes in the roof, but, but the man with the coal truck had come that week and dumped some coal down in the basement. And mama went down in the basement with a little pail and shovel. Some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about, but she made a fire in the pot belly stove in the living room. And she laid us down around the stove and we spent our first night, oh bless his name, in the new land that God had promised us in Richmond, Virginia. Well, I told you that was Christmas Eve and the next day was Christmas Day. I want you to know when we got up, there was no Christmas tree and there were no bicycles, there were no skates, there were no doll babies. Mama said, well, Merry Christmas, babies. I want y'all to sit right here by the stove. And she went in the closet and went in the little suitcase. She had five little brown paper bags with a little red ribbon tied around the top of it. And all of us grabbed our little bags and, and we opened up the bags real excited. And I reached my hand down in the bag and in the little bag there was an apple and there was an orange. There was a little candy cane stick and, and some of that Christmas candy that get all stuck together and get lint on it when you put it in your pocketbook. But I want you to know we were grateful for what God had done for us. Oh, bless his name. And so, every now and then, I miss my mama. And this little song wells on my heart. I stand on my back porch sometime, and I just sing these words. I'm kind of homesick. For a country to which I never have never been before. No time, no goodbye. Will there be spoken? Oh, oh, oh. And time, time won't matter. Mm -hmm. Time won't matter anymore. Oh. I think about Mama and I sing these words.
sweet Thank you all so much for coming. We're so lucky to have these wonderful, wonderful musicians here. Um, if you want to come and get talk to them about their music, come down and talk to them after their concert. So here are the legendary Ingramets one more time.
So thank you all. Please come down and, and please and have the come and talk to the band and the singers. And if you'd like to get a hold of some of their music, come and talk to them. They have CDs. Thank you all for coming today. We have another concert in July in one week. Rahim Al Haj, who is an Iraqi American oud player, will be playing here in a trio. Noon. Thursday, July 28th. So please join us. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.